So I've turned down a ton of reviews for pre-built systems in the past. Most of the time, you could just build yourself a similarly spec'd out machine for significantly less money. Now that's no different when it comes to the Corsair One. However, the extra premium that you're spending here for this machine can actually be justified. So today we're going to test it out and see how fast this thing really is and also test out Corsair's very interesting thermal design. Okay, so the one that I've got here is considered the mid-range model, the i160, and this comes packed with Intel's 9900K CPU, an RTX 2080 Ti for graphics, and 32 gigabytes of RAM. As I hinted at in the intro, the price here is definitely steep, with the i160 available for 3600 US dollars. For some perspective, you could populate similar hardware into an N-Case M1 that would land you around the $3,000 mark, and that's even with a much faster SSD compared to the very slow 5400 RPM mechanical drive in the Corsair 1. Now on a positive note, I've got to say I'm a big fan of the Corsair 1's design on the exterior. The panels are aluminium with a dark grey anodized finish, and there's only some subtle branding on the front panel. You've also got some tasteful RGB illumination which fills the gap between the front and side panels, and this can be customized in Corsair's IQ software. There's no thumb screws or airflow choking glass here, just a really nice vertical functional exterior. Moving around to the sides, we can see some triangular cutouts in the side panels, providing the radiators on both sides with some fresh air, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But towards the back, you'll find your motherboard's I.O. You do get USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type-C, but overall, I found that the number of Type-A ports might be a bit lacking for some. You've also got access to your display ports at the very bottom of the case next to the power supply, and you'll find an additional HDMI connector at the very front alongside two USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports. Now, I'm a big fan of the vertical form factor of the Corsair One as it reduces the overall footprint on your desk. And despite coming in at a very similar build volume to the NK M1 at around 12 and a half liters, its footprint is barely half the size. Also with the 22 liter Fantex Evolve shift standing right next to it, which is also a vertically oriented case, the Corsair One looks absolutely tiny in comparison. All right, now let's open this guy up. And to do that, you'll need to firmly press this button at the rear towards the top. The top panel should release, allowing you to lift it off, giving you a peek at the internal layout of the Corsair One and the thermal design. The top mounted fan is a 140 mm maglev fan from Corsair. This pulls air through the case and exhausts it out of the top. And we'll talk more about this in a little bit, but let's get to the rest. So to release the side panels, you'll just need to remove two screws on either side for each side panel. And with some light assistance, they should hinge outwards quite conveniently like this. So it's a back-to-back -back layout with your motherboard and power supply on one side and your GPU on the other side, connected by a PCIe riser cable. As you can see, everything is very tightly packed with pretty much no empty volume going to waste. It's here that you can appreciate that you're not just paying for the hardware in the Corsair One, but also the tedious assembly of the system and including cable management. Now, the best part about the Corsair One, in my opinion, is the thermal design. And to start with, both the CPU and GPU are liquid cooled, and this results in great noise and thermal performance. Both the 9900K and 2080 Ti are hooked up to fairly OEM looking radiators that don't have any fans mounted to them at all. They're also only 20 millimeters thick, so pretty slim, and they're not of any standard size. The radiator for the 2080 Ti is quite a bit longer, spanning the entire length of the side panel, but still the primary cooling for these radiators relies only on that single 140mm exhaust fan at the top. The 2080 Ti gets some additional cooling for the VRM and memory modules via this slim fan here, definitely appreciated for such a power hungry card. The exact 2080 Ti that we're using here is the MSI Ventus, which is MSI's entry level 2080 Ti, but no problem here since it's liquid cooled anyway. So now let's look at some performance numbers for the Corsair One i160, starting with a few games at 1440p. As you probably expected, since we're running an RTX 2080 Ti, which is the fastest consumer grade GPU at the moment, the Corsair One does top the charts. Frame rates here are pretty much as good as it's going to get for a pre-built single GPU system, and the fact that the GPU is liquid cooled keeps the temperatures nice and low, with the GPU's boost clock nice and high at around 1900 MHz. If you're using this system for gaming, I'd recommend at least a 1440p 144Hz monitor to really leverage the full potential of that RTX 2080 Ti. Now onto CPU performance. So we've got the i9-9900K in there, and it's clear that just by the multi-threaded Cinebench R15 scores that this chip is being locked to its 95 watt TDP, 
More on this in just a minute if you're not familiar with it. So whereas this processor should score us around the 2000 mark when the power is unlocked, we're scoring lower than the Ryzen 2700X, which is significantly cheaper. Single threaded scores are a bit better, but it's clear that we're not hitting the five gigahertz turbo frequency that we would have expected. File compression and decompression numbers are quite good thanks to the eight cores and 16 threads. And here we are able to edge out the overclocked Ryzen 2700X. Same goes for Blender where the Corsair one renders out a fairly demanding scene on the CPU in a little over 10 minutes and under three minutes when rendering out on the GPU. So to summarize CPU performance, it's fast, but it could be a bit faster. The 9900K is capable of much more as we know. That's because the motherboard that's being used here, MSI's Z370i Pro Carbon, is restricting the power limit on the 9900K. This chart here shows the 9900K's clock speed across all eight cores in Blender, and we're basically pinned under four gigahertz. Jumping into the BIOS, you can pretty easily fix this by setting the short and long power duration limits to their max values, setting the current limit also to max, and then the overcurrent protection to 170%. So now jumping into Cinebench R15, we get a much more respectable score of around 2000 points. However, we do run into a much bigger problem. So at idle, I saw the CPU sitting at around 45 degrees C, casually rising up to 55 to 60 when background tasks came around, but for the most part, we were sitting around 45. With the system running Blender, rendering out on the CPU, we see temperatures stabilize at around 75 degrees C once the exhaust fan starts spinning up. Overall, that seems pretty good, but do keep in mind that we are still running at the 95 watt TDP, which is preventing the CPU from clocking as high as it should be. So when we unlock the power limit, the system is no longer thermally stable and rises to 100 degrees C pretty rapidly. I also tried swapping the top fan to Noctua's legendary NFA 12x25 fan, and although we do get a really significant improvement, mostly due to me locking the fan at 2000 RPM, it's still not enough to keep the CPU cool at full tilt. So it's definitely a good idea on Corsair's behalf to restrict the power limit to Intel's spec of 95 watts, as system stability for the Corsair one is a lot more important than a 10% bump in performance. Still though, it would have been great to see the 9900K running cool at full power. And yes, that is something that can be done in this form factor. The N-Case M1, for example, can run an overclocked 9900K through the same blender scene and keep it under 80 degrees C. On the note of GPU thermals, I really hope that we get an update for controlling the fan curve on the top fan. The fan responds to both increases in CPU and GPU temperature, which is great, but it seems to be a bit more sensitive and sporadic when it comes to the GPU. We should see a flat line here on this graph, indicating that temperature and fan speed have stabilized, but it seems that the fan can't really make up its mind. Don't get me wrong, these are really solid thermals for a 2080 Ti, but with more options for fan control, we could dial this in a lot better. Now, one thing that's quite exceptional about the Corsair One i160 are the noise levels, and this thing is incredibly quiet considering the amount of power that this thing has, with a very minimal increase from the system being at idle to full load. So if you need a small form factor workstation that's incredibly quiet but still with top tier hardware, I can definitely recommend the Corsair One i160. If I personally couldn't be bothered to do the research of building my own system in something like the NCase M1, this is seriously what I would get instead. Now, there are a few more things that you would need to consider before buying though. The first thing is that despite this being incredibly powerful, there is a serious lack of upgradability. Upgrading your motherboard, CPU and drives should be okay, but upgrading the GPU down the road is going to be a serious pain in the butt if that's something that you would ever need to with a 2080 Ti in there. The other thing that I'll mention is that the current integration between the Corsair One and iQ needs a bit of work. iQ is Corsair's software for controlling the RGB lighting and to select a couple of fan profiles. But again, there's no option for advanced fan curves or anything like that, which would be really nice for a $3,500 machine. Additionally, iQ kept resetting itself every now and then, which was quite annoying. This would result in the RGB lighting on the front panel blinking every now and then, and also the Windows disconnection sound. Maybe it was just my sample, but I definitely think it's worth mentioning. Otherwise, the Corsair One strikes a really nice balance 
balance between thermals, performance, and sound. It doesn't try to, you know, go over the top on one at the expense of the other. Overall, it's a very well-built machine. You will have to pay a premium though, it is quite expensive. But like I said, I do feel like that premium is justified considering the amount of custom work that has gone into this, the amount of labor and, you know, tedious assembly as well. It's not like Corsair have just made, you know, a small form factor case and crammed standard compact hardware inside it. There has obviously been some, you know, research and costs associated with those slim radiators and the thermal design of this case. I can definitely approve of the final result because as I said, it is overall a very well built machine. If I was personally in the market for a pre-built Windows system, again, this is what I would personally be looking at. That's if I didn't want to go through all of that research of, you know, building my own system in a small form factor case. And like I said, some people just don't want to do that. So if you're interested, I will link the i160 down below in the description and also the cheaper i140 and the more premium i180. So if you're interested, definitely check out those links. As always, guys, a huge thanks for watching. Consider subscribing down below if you haven't already, and I will see you all in the next one.